<laughs> Shock and awe. Uh, you know why? Break along. Because he touched me. Well done, Sean. God bless the worship team. I don't want any early good mornings, all right? <laughs> I'm looking for an all nations good morning, so let's try that. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, you're getting better and better. There's no doubt about that, but we've got to be really excited for this good morning because guess what next Sunday is? It's Advent, and it means the light is coming. So let's do that again. Good morning. Good morning. And it is a good morning. You know why? Because we don't live in Buffalo. God bless them and all their snow shovels. There's no doubt about that. It's a good morning, because I don't know about you, but when I got out this morning to start my prayers and I looked up at that sun, it was coming over the horizon, and although cold, it was glorious. It was glorious to me, reinforcing God's creation and how magnificent that creation is. And when you saw that sun shine, I hope when you looked in the mirror, you continued to see his magnificence, because your image is in all of us. And God's image is magnificent, and you and I are magnificent. And let us celebrate that glory. Let's celebrate the sun that is in each of us. And today, that's why we come to here. And that's why it's a good morning. I just love coming here on Sunday mornings. I don't know about you. That fellowship, that friendship, that wonderful understanding of who the All Nations family is. Last Saturday, I spoke at the Multicultural Gala, and we talked about the diversity in Canada and the magnificence of that mosaic. Look around this church this morning. We are that magnificent mosaic. God bless all of us. Good morning as well, because in fact, Steve and Rita are not here, but Steve and Rita, by the way, are the experts on soccer. They have that soccer academy they're starting in Sudbury, and they are just wonderful people. So I actually had a pun for Steve. Why wasn't Cinderella very good at soccer? Because her coach was a pumpkin. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> World Cup today. Give me a break. It's very timely. There's no doubt about that. And what did one snowman say to the other snowman? Can you smell carrots? <laughs> <laughs> and enough of that, all right? Because we're here for God's word, and that's why we come to church. We don't come to church necessarily just for that fellowship or that friendship. We come to the word, and that word is what we're going to talk about today in the parable of the lost coin. Uh, Luke's book, that chapter 15, has lots of lo lostness. The lost son, the prodigal son. Last Sunday, what did we preach on? The lost sheep, the shepherd. And this is the final one, the lost coin. So please stand with me as we're going to read three very brief verses with regard to that wonderful parable. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a candle, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my lips and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. My great uncle Ern was the patriarch of my grandmother's family. My grandma came from a family of eight children from the farming country of Essex, Kent County. Her dad, Alexander, died when he was 42 years old of the flu. And as was the custom of the day from farming families, the eldest son uh, became the elder of the family and was able to make sure the farm continued. So Uncle Ern was that patriarch. And he was a magnificent man. I actually had the pleasure to get to know him as my great uncle. He looked like Abraham Lincoln, truly. He had that little beard and dark hair, put a stove hat on him. He could have liked to be the president of the United States, all right? But, but he had the wisdom of Abraham, too. 
uh, he was honest, had integrity. He was a devoted and dedicated Methodist. He went to church every Sunday, and he read his Bible every day. Now, my great uncle Mel got religion. That infectious implication in Essex, Kent County meant he became Pentecostal. So there he is becoming Pentecostal, and Uncle Mel was a very good Pentecostal member. In fact, he severed off part of his farm and built a Pentecostal church, and they held worship services on his farm. But he knew, he knew if he could have his born-again experience and he could share that with Uncle Ern, that that multitude of Methodist sinners would see the light and come over to his little church on the corner of his farm. So he used to harass my great uncle Ern all the time, all right? He'd be going over there. Uncle Ern, by the way, didn't believe in tractors. He still had workhorses, king and queen. Got to tell you, he's a city kid from Sudbury. When you went and visited him, he put on one of those big horses. Oh, that was exciting, I'll tell you. Meanwhile, Mel was walking beside him, harassing him about, do you know Jesus, all right? And Ern would just bow, nod his head and say, I do think I know Jesus. And they would have this conversation all the time. But then one day, Mel comes over to Ern. He said, Ern, you should have been at the prayer meeting last night. He said, Amelia, that was his wife, got full of the Holy Spirit. And she took right off the ground and she started flying around the ceiling of the church. <laughs> Remember Abraham Lincoln, my Uncle Ern? He looked over at Mel and he said, well, Mel, you've gone too far this time. You've said that Amelia has defied the law of gravity. Got to remember these guys are brothers. Uh, Mel looks back at Ern and says, well, you know, you got me there, Ern. I never did study law. <laughs> Today, our scriptures uh, focus on Sir Isaac Newton's pr premise and principle of the law of gravity, which kept my uncle Ern firmly grounded in the gospel. The passage that we just read says there was a woman that had silver coins and she, by mistake, took one off a table, and, and she was lost that coin and started to look for it. The text states, but the Pharisees were murmuring because Jesus was keeping company with publicans and sinners. Remember last Sunday we talked about that, how, how these Pharisees said, oh, look at that Jesus guy. He's hanging out with publicans and sinners. Publicans? Publicans in today's society, although they were tax collectors back then, they were pretty corrupt and they're pretty confusing. I might suggest today that I might suggest a publican is the person who is setting the grocery prices. That would be a publican for me, all right? A uh, publican to me might be the guy at that Bank of Canada that keeps putting those interest rates up, all right? Th those publicans are out there and they kind of start create negative issues with regard to society. And yet I suggest to you today that the Pharisees and scribes, they thought those publicans and sinners, well, guess what? We are righteous men. There's a wonderful line from the musical Carousel that says there's nothing such as bad as a man who thinks he's good, all right? <laughs> and on that basis, these Pharisees went with their long robes and their noses turned up and their lips turned up and they wanted to have nothing to do with anything that seemed to be remotely like sin. Further, remember Jesus indicated what last week? Are you paying attention now from last week? Remember when the sheep got found? What was the expectation? What was the result? What was the response? When the shepherd found the sheep, what did he do? He rejoiced, remember? He rejoiced that he found the lost sheep. Well, I got to tell you, these Pharisees, remember last week, they weren't such rejoicing people. They, in fact, had a sour cynicism, and they were quite indifferent to Jesus' comment about this rejoicing God that you and I know that loves us. I recall the story about the woman who fancied herself a little bit holier than thou, and she was outside sweeping her sidewalk when a street person went by, and he was not very well dressed, and he looked not great hygiene, he looked like he had a lot of troubles, and when she saw this man walking by her house, she turned her head, rolled her eyes, and looked the other way. The man looked over at the woman, and he yelled, Hey, lady, you got any empty beer bottles I can have? The woman quite taken back and she looked over at him and said how dare you do I look like the kind of woman that would drink beer to which he looked at her and said oh sorry ma'am do you have any pickle jars or vinegar bottles 
the Pharisees just look righteous, all right? They were sour and cynical about any concept of a rejoicing God. To this self-impressed, stuck-up crowd, Jesus tells the second parable that you and I read. A woman has ten pieces of silver, and she loses one piece of silver. Last Sunday, there was a hundred sheep, remember that? Lost one sheep. That's one hundredth of the flock. Uh, today, uh, the silver coin, that's one-tenth of her savings. By the way, just so you understand, 10 silver coins was like an entire annual wage for that particular woman. So she's lost one-tenth of her income. What Jesus is telling us in the subsequent parable is that this is really important stuff. This is going to affect that woman's life that she has lost that coin. If we go back to the original translation uh, that we read this morning, the silver coin, in fact, in Jesus said it was a drachma. A drachma is the Greek word for the world of a silver coin. Drachmas were silver coins. That's the only place in the New Testament that the word drachma is ever used, is in this parable in the translation. Everywhere else in the Gospels, the silver coin is called a denarius. A denarius is a Roman coin. But today, only once in the New Testament, Jesus, in his conversation with this crowd, says the word drachma. I suggest to you this morning that Jesus is telling that woman, telling that crowd, telling those Pharisees, telling all of us, this is a very special coin. This coin has significance. This meant something to her. Houses were dark in the first century. Windows were about 18 inches apart. There wasn't a lot of natural light. Uh, oil was expensive and hard to come by. So you didn't just light candles indiscriminately. In that darkness, the woman hears something falling on the ground. Darkness can be a problem. Uh, if you remember a few sermons ago, I talked about fearfulness. I, I'm a bit afraid of the dark, but I was really afraid of the dark when I was a little guy. I was really, really afraid of the dark, and, and it would be really dark in my bedroom, and I'd be really, really thirsty, and I had to get a drink of water, and I would jump out of bed, and I'd run and get the glass of water, and I would gulp down the water, and then I would run like a bunny and jump into the bed, wanting to avoid that hand that lived underneath my bed that would grab me by the ankle, never to be seen again, all right? So, so darkness can be a problem. Darkness can be worrisome. Darkness can be wearisome. Darkness can be troublesome. Darkness is a problem. Sin is a dark house. Sin has a medium of exchange in disillusionment, in sorrow, and in death. Unrepentant sin has caused our generation to be dragged into a black hole of shadowy values and spiritual blindness. There's a wonderful piece that is written that I want you to really listen to, to understand that that wasn't just rhetoric that I shared with you right now. That's a reality of the age we live in. I really want you to really pray about going to that living nativity and being a volunteer. You say, well, it's like Jesus being born. No, 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 no. It's a statement about our faith. Think about this. I am willing to bet you today that we are the only Christian church in North America that's going to have a living nativity on a science center parking lot, all right? If you want to make a statement of faith, don't do it in our parking lot. This is a church parking lot. Go down to Science North and say, guess what? We've got great news. We're proclaiming Jesus is born in Sudbury, Canada, and in the world. Yes. Because these statements scare me, and yet I know they are truthful. When I talk about that shadowy values and spiritual blindness, think about this. Politics without principle. Pleasure without conscience. Wealth without work. Knowledge without character. Industry without morality. Science without humanity. Worship without sacrifice. Those are pretty scary statements, don't you think? And yet every one of them, I don't know about you, but when I found this piece, I could relate to every one of those statements on a daily basis in the society that you and I live. Unrepentant sin has caused our society uh, to live in a dark house. Gravity, gravity does its best work when the lights are out. 
In the dim light, the woman inadvertently sweeps her hand across the table, and one of her precious silver coins, one of her drachmas, becomes caught up in a theological drama greater than she or it. It falls off the table. Whatever's on the table falls to the floor. Falling itself would have been bad enough. If the coin had just fallen and she's in the dark and she could kind of hear where it is, she might have got lucky, eh, and reached down and picked up that coin. But, but there is another wonderful Sir Isaac Newton's laws that come into force, and that is the law of centrifugal force. Centrifugal force is when a round object starts rolling. So the coin hits the ground, and it starts rolling away. The coin starts rolling away, centrifugal force. So the question then becomes, once you have fallen, how far do we roll away? It's one thing to fall. How far do you roll? What's Lockheed talking about today? What are you talking about, Jerry? No, no, no. When does that social drink become an alcoholic addiction? When can you just not get enough booze, all right? But, but it was just a drink before dinner. It was just a glass of wine. But, but all of a sudden, <laughs> i got to have the whole bottle of wine. All of a sudden, i got to have two drinks before dinner. All of a sudden, oh, that beer, uh, that beer, I can go through a case of beer on a weekend. W when have we decided that social drink has become the addiction. W when does that marital squabble <laughs> become spousal abuse? W when is those angry words translated into angry actions? When does that idle gossip become vicious slander uh, that really is hurtful to people? When does that emphatic profanity <laughs> become common discourse? All right? And if you think I'm exaggerating this morning, turn on the radio and listen to the songs, all right? I'll tell you, once upon a time at my dinner table, if we said any bad words, my mother would have Joffrey and I leave the table because you weren't allowed to speak that way in the house. Now you can listen to the radio and they're singing every word that you ever thought of and it's written on every rock over in Sudbury. All right? Th that's not right. It is not right. Remember the crazy old story. In a more traditional church, there was a young minister that came to preach his very first sermon. And he came to preach his very first sermon. And, and often when new ministers come, if you don't come during COVID, unfortunately, Sean, but if you don't come during COVID, everybody shows up because they all want to see what the new minister looks like. He could have two heads, could he be polka dotted. You never know that new minister. And so God forbid that you actually came late. It means you'd have to sit in the front row. God bless all of you, by the way. <laughs> Harry, you're always up here. Good man. I appreciate that. All right. These are brave souls. All right. What did Mark Twain once say? We like the front of the bus, the back of the church, and the middle of the road. Well, guess what? As Christians, we often are all back there, all right? So there is some empty seats. Invite some friends next Sunday, all right? So on that basis, this young minister is in the, in the pulpit for the very first time. And one of the paragons, the matriarchs of his church, a wonderful person like Jean LaHood, who inspires me every time we talk, and she tries to get my sermons to be even better, and I'm working on that, Jean. And today, you're going to love the Godhead when we get to the end of it. Well, just wait, though. So... Jean's sitting right where you guys are, all right? She's sitting right in the front row. And this young man comes up, and he starts to preach, and he gets really full of the Holy Spirit, and he's right into it. And he comes to a very important line of his sermon where it says, Behold, I come quickly, and guess what? His mind goes blank. He remembers back in Bible college, it says, his professor said, If your mind goes blank, repeat the line again, and your train of thought may come back. So with even more power, he says, behold, I come quickly. And again, he's gone blank. He thought three times can't hurt, and he yells again, behold, I come quickly, and he hit the pulpit, and it broke off, and it fell right in the lap of Gene Mahood in the front row, all right? <laughs> he jumps off the platform. He gets down. He takes off the pulpit. He starts to apologize to her to profusely, and she looks at him and says, Pastor, don't apologize. I should have moved. You told me three times you're coming quickly, all right? <laughs> Jesus in the parable is telling you and I, move quickly, all right? Get out of the dark, all right? I, I'm telling you this three times in the book of Luke. Prodigal sons, lost sheep, lost coins. Hey, are you listening to me? Come on, move quickly. Get out of that darkness and be found. The fact of the matter is today that we need to not move away from the darkness, back to the light. Jesus is telling us to quit rolling away, to confess our sins and invite him into our hearts. You know the prayer, don't you? I hope you know the prayer. We all know the prayer. Oh, Lord God, I repent of my sins. Come into my heart. I'll make you my Lord and Savior. All right? And if you say that prayer, it is considered that you, in fact, are repentant and you will be saved. 
simple three sentences. Are, are you prepared to say that? And I'm not just saying right now. You've you got to be right in your heart to say that. You've got to be prepared to say that. I repent of my sins, come into my heart, I'll make you my Lord and Savior. That's the prayer that is most important. But I've got to tell you, Gloria and Michelle were praying for me uh, before we come into this service. Michelle made a really good prayer for me. She said, we want people to find Jesus, to be saved, to be reborn. But those of us that, in fact, have been saved, we need to reconnect with that Savior. We need to re-initiate ourselves to Jesus' fellowship. That you and I need to understand things. Because I've got to tell you, as much as I want to tell you that Jesus is my Savior, on some days, the evil one is out there. Some days, the evil one is saying, good for you, Lockheed, you're, you're saved, but, but I, got, I got some things to kind of mess you up on. I, I got some things to tempt you with. Uh, how about your body, Lockheed, all right? Uh, uh, you know what? Go ahead and eat that box of Timbits. It's not going to hurt you at all, all right? Get as much white sugar as you can, all right? It's a wonderful thing. The temple of God's going to be really fat, a lot of cholesterol in it, can hardly move around. But boy, oh boy, evil one, just let me have those Timbits, right? That's my, my, my mind, uh, my mind. How about when I watch movies that have gratuitous sex and violence in them that have absolutely no purpose but to entertain me with the evil one's thoughts that I really shouldn't be thinking? Uh, and I line up and I pay money to go to those movies that I know are wrong and are teaching wrong things and are teaching things that I really know are inconsistent with Jesus' teachings, and yet that messes up my mind, but I go back and watch those movies again. H how about my soul, all right? W when I'm told, you don't, you don't have to come to church. D don't come to church, all right? It doesn't matter if you go to church. You know what? You can listen to it on the radio. And, and if you get a little bored, you can turn the radio off, all right, can't you? And, and you don't need to pray, do you? No, you're kind of tired. So, so in the morning, you've you got to get up. You've got to get to work, all right? So you know, you're not, and at night, you're too, you're too tired to pray. So, so don't pray. The evil one is out there. He wants me to be fat. He wants me to be corrupt. He wants me to be in the darkness. And you and I hear this morning that Jesus is saying to us, I want you to understand this parable. You are that coin. With a woman's coin rolled away from her, she could not find it. She lit a lamp and started to sweep the house. If something is of value to us, no matter how far it rolls, we will search until we find it. And what did you read today? What did the woman say when she found the coin? Rejoice with me. It's there again, friends. Rejoice with me. Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace that I had lost. Got to tell you something really clearly. This parable is not about lost change. This parable is about lost souls. It's about you and I and being lost in that darkness. Jesus is telling us today that when he finds us, Jesus says, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repented. So if you have fallen into the deepest pig pen of pathology, if you've rolled to the farthest corner of inequity, whether with sins of intent, when in fact we have intentionally sinned with false gods, what did Brandon preach two Sundays ago? He talked about materialism. He talked about we worship gods of materialism. That, that's sinning, folks, all right? Uh, what about covets? Do we covet? Do we covet our neighbor? Do we keep up with the Joneses? Is, is that coveting? See, I don't necessarily think you're going to rob a cornerstone. I don't think you're going to beat up somebody. I don't think you're going to murder somebody. But, but our sins can be subtle, and, and that darkness can start creeping into our lives. And you and I today, as we listen to this parable, need to stop that darkness and come back to the light. What about exploitation and exclusiveness? Like, what did I start off this sermon talking about? Look in the mirror. When you look in the mirror, you see God's image. So everything you said this week, everything you saw this week, did it bring glory to God or are you a bit embarrassed about what you said or what you saw? Uh, see, that's the exploitation. That's the exclusiveness. We have to understand God is in each of us and we need to respect that. What about the sins of indifference? Your kids, your grandchildren, they all get well fed. Eh? So, so that breakfast program in the schools, that's eh, okay. Did you know that the breakfast program in the summer is stopped? <laughs> does, does that mean kids don't eat breakfast in the summer? All right, now They get it in the winter months. A as a people of faith, how, how should we address that? Well, I've got to tell you, 
those crazy Salvation Army people, all right? <laughs> the wear the uniforms, blood and <laughs> blood and fire, you know, those folks. Well, well, guess what? They knew that in the flour mill there wasn't any breakfast programs, so they actually set up a breakfast program for July and August so those kids would get fed. But you and I, our kids are fed well. My grandson is fed well. He's looked after well. Did we understand how important that program is? What about the elderly? Do you, do you believe we should all look after the elderly really well? I, I would think so, right? But if we are not necessarily going to let them be in homes that are nonprofit, then we're giving them to homes that are for profit, that are more worried about currency than caring. Do we need to understand as people of faith that our light has to shine brightly on that? Hey, how about the homeless problem, eh? In Sudbury, boy, we got a homeless problem. Who should look after that? Oh, the mayor and the police, right? G get them right after that. W where are we in that? All right? So as we stand in our darkness, because we have that creeping sin that gets into our lives, that we need to go back to that light. But the other good thing about Newton's laws, he's got a great law, doesn't he? The other law says, to every action, there is always an opposed and equal reaction. Jesus offers us the gift of grace. He brings us back to the light. He is telling you and I what is important in our lives. And it isn't keeping up with the Joneses. And it isn't any of that material stuff. And it isn't looking after somebody else. It's looking after ourselves and those we love. I got to tell you, I'm very, as many of you know, a tremendous champion of the hospice. And I've been to the hospice many, many hundreds of times. Ashley's here today. Ashley raises a million dollars to make sure those doors stay open. So thank you for all your support. But I got to tell you, in going to the hospice, I I've never sat in the hospice with family or friends and somebody said to me, Jerry, you know what? I I I'd like you to go to my house and bring me back my job performance review. I I'd like to look at that one more time, all right? Never seen that in palliative care ever, all right? W what I have seen is I really hope all my kids come. I, I really hope they bring the dog. I really hope they have my grandchildren come here. Th that's the conversations on a hospice. I visit my buddies in the nursing homes, eh? I've never seen a giant TV screen in a nursing home room. I've never seen even a queen-size bed, Harry, all right? But what I have seen, a lot of albums of pictures and collages of family on the walls, all right? I've written likely more obituaries than anybody else in Sudbury, perhaps in Canada, all right? And I sit down with bereaved people, and I've never had a bereaved person say to me, and by the way, Jerry, just put my husband's gross income in the obituary. I'd like everybody know how much money he made, all right? Never have heard that, all right? What I have heard, <laughs> my dad gave the best hugs in the world, all right? My grandma took us all to the Dairy Queen. I love going with my dad. He always was there for the hockey games or the ringette games. I isn't it funny what is important in our lives is what brings us the light. This morning, are you rolling away to a dark corner or are you taking your place at the Lord's table? And we must realize we are special coins and that when we repent, we can get the gift of grace. But you know what my buddy, Jima Hood's going to tell me when I finish this sermon, I see her this week? She's going to say, well, that, that was really good, Jerry, but it isn't just repentance. It isn't just getting in God's good books. you got to do something when you're there. Once you repent, there is an obligation for you to take your repentance and be committed to doing something about that. What, what are you committed to? Prayer? Are you going to pray better? You, you find Jesus as your Savior. It, it isn't a comfortable Savior. He's an expectant Savior. Okay, you're going to follow me, then follow me and pray with me. Pray in the morning. Pray at night. When you see that sun this morning, you say, thank you, Lord. Boy, th that's a wonderful part of creation. When you come to this fellowship, thank you, Lord. I really enjoyed this fellowship today. But now I'm going to pray that my light shines brightly beyond these walls. Priorities. What's your priority? If you are saved, if you understand that you are repentant, if you understand that Jesus died for you, what is your priority? You know what it is. What? Love God, heart, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Wh what is your love of your neighbor? Okay? There's some other forms to sign out there. Go and help a neighbor. Back to those Salvation Army people. Uh, blood and fire. All right? The blood, by the way, is Jesus. The fire is the Holy Spirit. I have volunteered our church. Labors of the Lord. God bless you all. All right? I have volunteered our church on Saturday, December 17th 
from 8 in the morning till 1 o'clock in the afternoon, you and I are going to ring the bells over the kettles of the Salvation Army, which is every kettle the Salvation Army has in Sudbury, and we're the only church in the history of this community that has said we're taking on that commitment because our priority is to love our neighbor. And we're going to love our neighbor. It sounds really good, but you're going to stand there for an hour with a little jingle bell thing, and you're going to tell people that you want the blood and fire supported. That's an hour of priority to do what? To love your neighbor, all right? And passion, all right? Passion. Do you have a passion? Are you sitting in that pew just kind of waiting to see it's 1056? You'll be done in six minutes, all right? Are you sitting in that pew thing at all? We've heard this all before, all right? Get Sean up here with the guitar. It sounded pretty good. Let's get that touching thing going again. I kind of like singing that, all right? I, I can't wait to get out to Tim Hortons. I hope we're ahead of the Catholics. They always seem to get there ahead of us, all right? <laughs> Are you sitting here with a passion? The passion that you came to God's house? A passion that Jesus died for you? Do you have the passion to invite somebody here next Sunday? You're doing pretty good. If you looked six Sundays ago, we had a lot more empty spaces then. We're filling the place up, all right? But we're, yes, we have, yes, let's apply for that. Let's fill the place up, all right? Let's have the passion to do that. Why did I say it was a good morning? Because next Sunday, the light's coming. Jesus is going to get born. Is there a better time to invite people? Sean and I are going to do tag teams for the next four Sundays with regard to the light that's coming into the world. Bring your family and your friends. Tell them why you're coming here, because you're going to share the light. That's what this sermon was all about, sharing the light, finding light, getting back into the light. And that, my friends, is the prayer and the priority and the passion. And then we're not going to be devalued loonies, but in fact, we are going to be drachmas of divine redemption. How do I close this? Picture, friends. There we is. We lost the sheep. We really lost the sheep last Sunday, right? <laughs> but we found the lost coin, all right? So what are you looking at? For the people that are on radio land, we just put a picture up on our big screens. And it's a picture that was painted in 1613 by an Italian artist. His name was Domenico Fetti. And this is the picture that he calls the lost drachma. And it's a picture of the parable that we all just said and I just preached about. And this is a powerful, powerful picture. And if you want to Google it, I've given you the references. Domenico Fetti, 1618, Finding the Lost Drachma. And that picture is the Godhead. That picture is something that as people of faith we often wrestle with, with regard how does that work. You've just got a picture of it from this parable. All right? Look at that darkness. Look at that darkness. That's the darkness of the secular world. That's the evil one. That's all the sin and badness and the bad decisions and all the stuff that shadows over us. And that's why it is a shadow. Last week, who is the shepherd? God, right? Guess what? The woman's the shepherd this time. She's looking for that coin, isn't she? G guess what the candle is? Guess what the candle is? The candle is Jesus, all right? Jesus is the candle. And what's the light? The light is the Holy Comforter. The light is the Holy Spirit. And guess what, friends? Who's the coin? <laughs> Do you soon know who the coin is? Say it. Who's the coin? We are, exactly. You are looking at God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and they are looking for us. And when they find us, what did it say in the Bible, in our parable? When the woman turns the house upside down, looking for the drachma, and when she finds it, she rejoices. When our shadowy values are turned upside down, when they are thrown away, when the likeness of the Creator is restored in each one of us and the Lord's light finds us, then Jesus says, I say unto you, even the, the joy in heaven in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And I'll tell you this, my great uncle Mel and my great uncle Ern and the choir of angels will say amen and will say amen.